Welcome to Fathers Who Bother, a podcast dedicated to the men who are dad as we want to be. My first guest is a true polymath, rapper, actor, singer, podcaster, and all-around showman, Fonte Coleman of Little Brother and the Foreign Exchange. In the first part of our two-part interview, we discuss his relationship with his father when he found out he was going to be a dad and how this all influenced his wonderful art. Check it out. All right. How you doing, ladies and gentlemen? This is your host, Jerry Barrow. Welcome to the first episode of Fathers Who Bother. I'm really excited because my first guest is partially responsible for inspiring this whole concept. He is a polymath writer, actor, singer, podcaster, just all around uh, dope gentleman. Member big of Big Words, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, wow. Wow. I mean, we've got history going back to 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 the little brother's first album, yes, and, and you know, foreign exchange, little brother breakup, little brother reunion, you know, <laughs> solo work, TV, the man, you know, we got a lot. But today, today, uh, we're gonna talk about something that's near and dear to both of our hearts, which is being fathers. I wanted to start with the, the question that I think I'm going to start with everybody is when did you first realize or when did you first find out that you were going to become a father yourself? Oh, my God. Um, I didn't know we were going to get into something so traumatic so early. Uh, <laughs> 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 but hey, I love it. I love it. Yo, this, this is why I fuck with you, Jerry Barrow. We, we get we get right into it. Dude, fuck right. it. Let's go. Man, listen. Um, so I found out out when I was gonna be a father. I was in college and um my girlfriend at the time she uh we had we had not seen each other like for a minute and um we had got together one night the the the, the fateful night in question <laughs> and um you know after that like we kind of had kind of broke up and like not seen each other you know for a minute and um but we were in the same department in um in in english you know we were in the same uh academic department so um she came to me one day and she was like look you know i'm late whatever and i'm like man we good because you know being young i mean we had dodged so many bullets <laughs> prior to that <laughs> right, you know what right, I'm saying? right like we 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 had played with fire so many times we was like Ooh. oh we we cool what you mean oh, it'll be cool it'll be cool Shooting but um the club. See? see i mean that shit sounded like a griselda ad lib nigga <laughs> <laughs> so so we was so yeah it was you know so i thought we was cool and um you know a few weeks later you know she came we she came she called me and um i went and uh you know we went and got a pregnancy test and um yeah man um you know she took the test and she was pregnant um that's the very abbreviated kind of uh PG version of the story. The much more extended uh, version will appear in my memoirs someday, uh, thirty years from now. <laughs> but <laughs> but that was that was just basically what it was. And so, you know, we she, we found out she was pregnant, and I was just like, well, I mean, I right. you know, like I wasn't um, I wasn't excited about it. Just to be very honest, you know, I wasn't excited. I was scared out of my fucking mind. You know, like I think a lot of guys are or, you know, and um, that was pretty much what it was. And, um, you know, she, you know, decided to, you know, to have my son. And from that point on, I was just like, well, I mean, this wasn't intentional. This wasn't like what I thought fatherhood would look like for me. Um, I, I never really even saw myself having kids, to be honest. You know what I'm saying? Um, fatherhood was never something that... Um, when I was, when I was, you know, growing up and, you know, you would just think about things you wanted, you know, all I wanted was just music. Like that was all I ever wanted to do. Just as, as long as I can remember, you know, I just saw my life involving just a lot of music, a lot of just making music and just, you know, just expressing myself in that way. I never thought I would be a father at all. Like that was something I had absolutely no interest in whatsoever. And, um, but you know, it, 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 it came, it happened. And so from that point on, I just said, well, you know, I can't be, you know, the way my father was like, I want to be, you know, in my son's life and, and be present. And I just gotta, you know, I just gotta suck it up and figure this shit out. 
And uh, that was, God, that was 19, almost 20 years ago at this point. Yeah. So what was your relationship like with your father? Because you kind of alluded to this in All For You from the Minstrel Show. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, man. Um, So my dad was, um, it's, my parents were very young when they had me. My mom was 17. And my dad, no, I'm sorry. My, my, my dad was 17 and my mom was 15. So they were, you know, in high school, you know what I mean? And uh, like my mother, yeah, my mother, I think she was, I think she was like a sophomore in, um, in, in high school when she had me. But, um, you know, and so growing up, I didn't, I mean, they were just, my mom was just my mom. You know, I didn't realize that how much, how young she was, you know, cause yeah, as a kid, you just look and it's just, that's just mom. You know what I mean? And, you know, and my dad, I mean, he was just, all right, well, that's my dad. You know, it, it didn't occur to me as a child that my parents were also children. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you don't register that. That didn't register until much later. And so, um, so yeah, my, my dad, um, he, he wasn't really in the picture. Um, he was, uh, he was, he was out. He was, uh, he, had, um, ended up moving to DC. He left North Carolina and uh, he ended up like going and, and like living in DC and kind of just, you know, doing his own thing. And, um, I would see him here and there. Uh, but, I didn't really get a chance to really know him until probably the last couple of years of his life. And uh, he passed in 2016 and, you know, he came to see me one time in 2012. It was, it was funny. It was a girl he was seeing around my way. <laughs> and, <laughs> that sounds and, uh, consistent with what you've written about. <laughs> the brother, it is so consistent. He, man, he, listen, he stayed on brand to the very end. <laughs> so for better or for worse, he, he was him to the end. But uh, he had a girl he was seeing and, and uh, the drama way, and he's like, "Hey, man, what's up? Uh, I think I'm coming around your way, and uh, this is this girl I'm seeing. You know, I'm, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come holler at you." And I'm just like, "Okay, all right, cool." And you know, he shows up to my crib, and he had a suitcase with him. I was like, "Nigga, what the fuck you doing with this suitcase?" And first off, like it was the raggediest goddamn suitcase I've ever seen in my life. I was like, "Nigga, what are you, bro? Do you not?" have a job what the fuck where you can travel this suitcase nah man this is i like that this is my suitcase i like it i said all right okay cool so um but he showed up with a suitcase him and um his girl at the time his girlfriend they came over to my house and it was just me and my sons there and um you know when we were you know he came over and you know i cooked dinner and we ate and he ended up staying with me i think he ended up staying with me for about two three days and um you know that was the most time i'd ever really spent with my dad in that way and it taught me so much about myself. It was so many things that he did that I didn't, you know, know where I got it from. Like we mm. went to, I remember we went to Target and I was buying stuff <laughs> for my crib and he was like liking the same stuff. I was like, yeah, like I like these earth tones. I like this for the table. I like this. And the the, the taste that we had, it was like the same. I was like, damn. And <laughs> You know, we were checking out and we, we were about to check out uh, at, at, the, at the target and I went and grabbed me some some peanut M&Ms and he was like, oh, you you like peanut M&Ms? I was like, yeah, I love it. He's like, yeah, man, this, I eat these all the time. And I, I again, I never knew like we went out to eat. And like, you know, I was cooking well, before we went out to eat. I went out. I, I was cooking fish at the house for everybody. And um, I made a piece of salmon that was, you know, kind of, you know, medium rare. It was a little it wasn't as cooked as the other pieces I made. And I said, you know, I said, Dad, look, I got this piece right here. I said, you know, I got another one coming. If you like it a little done more. He's like, no, nah, man, nah, I, I like mine bloody, man. You, you ain't got to cook mine. I, I like it. And. That's the same way I like mine. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's the same way I like my salmon. The same way I like my right. steak. Like I like right. it medium rare. You know what I mean? So it was just so wild. And you know, man, it was it was crazy. I I, I later just had the thought, like years after, you know, when he passed. Um, I, I really think that was him saying goodbye. Um, mm. you know, he was really uh secretive about his health. Um, and it was a lot of problems that he had that I didn't find out about until 
months down the line, almost until the point where he was almost about to die. Like when I went to see him kind of in the last, I think maybe in the last year and I was sitting with the doctor and the doctor is just reading off a laundry list of health problems. Ooh. And me and my brother just sitting there like, what the fuck? Like what? Like we, yeah, you know, we had to take his toe. Like I remember his doctor was like this. He was, I don't, I won't, he was, he was African. I, I don't know what country he was from, you know, but he was, you know, he was, he was a, he was an African doctor and his bedside manner was trash. Right. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I remember that <laughs> man, like his bedside manner was just, he, you know, he just didn't have really good uh, bedside decorum. So he was just very matter of fact. Yes. Your, your father, your, his heart is only working at 30% and his kidneys are failing and his heart, it will, it would not last. And we have, I was like, nigga, whoa, hold up. God damn, nigga, what? <laughs> he was just running it. And so, um, yeah, man, never, but you know, I never thought to it? fight. A, I never thought to fight a doctor until my father was on on his deathbed. I, the way really, because my father, you know, he he had a stroke a year before he passed, and mm. he was his. He also had heart issues. That's what kind of led to everything. He had surgery for a, a, a chamber in his heart, and they did they replaced the valve or something. And then he like a month after a month into his recovery from that, he had a stroke paralyzed his whole right side of his body. Shit. And then things, things just went downhill from there. And then I remember towards the end, the doctor just basically came to me and my mom started talking about, um, what's the word they like to use when you want to start? I don't, what was it? Hospice. Oh, hospice. Or, yeah. Hospice. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, wait, or like, like, it's like, do you, do, you have to sign this paper saying, Oh, do DNR. Do, uh, not, DNR, do not resuscitate. Oh yeah. my DNR goodness. order. Yeah, he, man. He asked my mother with a straight face, like, so how do you feel about it? Um, you know, would you sign this DNR order? I'm like, so they're, they're basically saying if he goes, he has a We problem, need permission to kill him. Yes. <laughs> we and need your permission no, to let him die. <laughs> bruh, I was ready to just haul off on this doctor. I'm like, are you serious? Are you trying to tell me you're not even going to try to save my father's life right now? And it took everything. My sister, my wife, everybody was like, Jerry, just go over here while we talk to the doctor. And I'm just like, yo, they are wild. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, it, yo, it's so real, man, because it's and like I, I get it because it's just so they have to make those hard decisions. And I mean, in the case of my dad, I mean, listen, dude, like by the time I found out what it was, his heart, I think, was only working at like a 10 percent capacity. Oof. You know, what I mean? so it was it was I mean, it essentially it literally was just a matter of time. Like we were just counting down and, you know, he had you know congestive heart failure. Similar thing. It was congestive heart failure uh, that was a result of diabetes. And then, you know, like he had to they had to take first they had to take a toe. Then they took, mm. you know, the foot. Then they had to take some more of his leg. Like, I mean, he ended up losing, you know, a leg. And it was just little by little. It was just like a slow deteriorating thing uh you know for like that last year and um you know the last time i saw him it was actually it was before foreign exchange show we had played uh we were, we were playing howard theater i guess this was back in this was 2016 uh we did a show at howard theater and um you know sold out show show was crazy and i went and to see him he was in a nursing home up in maryland before the show and me and my uh my wife or my then my my girl but you no know, now my wife uh, we went and see him and um that was the last time i saw him man and i just saw him and you know we talked and uh he was in a room with this other couple this other old older guy who uh was a, a diabetic patient who lost his leg and his wife was in there and um it was beautiful man like you know we just all had a conversation and several times during that conversation i remember my dad just breaking down crying mm -hmm. and um he just you know he was just saying you know i love you man and you know i'm proud of you and you know it was just all these things that i guess maybe he didn't have the words to say before you know but um he he you know we we were able to talk and that was the last time i saw him and um you know man the, the big part for me uh the biggest takeaway from just his life and what kind of led to just my parents and approach um with my with my sons was that i learned that the biggest gift that we can give our kids is the is the gift of ourselves the the best gift you can give your kids is giving them the opportunity to really know who you are and um i, I went through it a lot you know when my pop passed it was, i was really angry uh for I was, I was angry for a while just because it was so many questions that i had 
I wanted to ask him that I never got a chance to. And it was a lot of things I was going through in my adulthood, just as a young man, uh, that I, I, I had questions about. And, you know, I wish, you know, I would have had him, you know, to, to kind of help me through that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, was, yeah. So, yeah. And that was yeah. it. So with my kids, it was just like, yo, man, if nothing else, I want my boys to know me. I want them to really know their dad and know what I'm about, you know, know, you know, my good parts, my bad parts and, and everything, because the better they know me, the better they'll, they'll understand themselves. So how many kids do you have? Now? I have two boys, two, two boys, 19 and 14. Okay. Wow. So what's, what's that like? You got two teenagers, man. Listen, <laughs> never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, man, it's it's cool. You know, it, it's 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 very different. So, the the relationship I have with my nineteen year old is is very different than the relationship I have with my fourteen year old. Um, my nineteen year old, me and his mom, that was my college girlfriend, right? And you know, we right like today we're the best of friends. Like it's all love. Like we're you know like we're, we're we have an amazing relationship now, but that wasn't always the case. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. Cause you said, you said, I remember on all for you, you were like thinking I was in love, but really it changed trapped in this girl. You said yeah. a lot of people want to see me fail as a father. And that thought of haunts me, especially when I check my rear view mirror and don't see him in his car seat. I was like, damn, this brother is <laughs> reaching right now. Um, so what, yeah. so, so what's, how much of you, since you didn't, had that relationship with your father, how did you incorporate, I guess, the lack of him being around into raising your sons? Like, how did you turn that negative into a positive? Man, it was hard, you know, it, 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 it was hard. And it was um a lot of things that um I, I, I certainly I don't struggle with as much now, but uh, I know for the a bigger part of my twenties, um, my you know, my late twenties, you know, early thirties, I just really beat myself up about uh, because I never kids was never something that I wanted to have. Like I never saw myself as doing that. And so I felt guilty. Like I felt bad and I just always felt like I was a bad father and that I wasn't doing enough. You know what I'm saying? It always, you know, I, I always had this kind of insecurity of not being a good father. And, um, you know, and that, and that was, and I was really, I was really hard. I was really hard on myself. I would look around and see other kids, um, you know, or when I like when I would go to events with my son, like I have to go to like the, you know, the fucking the children's night at the school where they give a play or whatever fucking corny shit, right? You know what I mean? So you know, but you gotta go, and like you know, and my son at the time he's like five six, so he's like a kid. So I'm like, ah, I gotta go, and and I remember being in those spaces and just seeing all these dads with their cameras out and taking fifty million pictures, and you know, they smiling and shit, and I'm like, yo, I. I Am I just a fucking degenerate? Cause I don't care about none of this shit. Like I, you know what I mean? Like I don't like I, fuck this fucking play, dude. Like so fucking what? Like, nigga, who cares? Dude, they're fucking six. Like they can't sing. They're not talented. Like get me the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're speaking for so many parents right now who wouldn't have the balls to say what you said. But I've been to so many Christmas concerts and I'm just bro, like, oh, bro. Please. Oh, we have to be here right do now. we really get to do this is there any other way i can show my look please let me write a check where, where, where can i just write the check to just <laughs> tell me where to send the check and i can take my ass home and it'd it be over with that's it oh. yeah but so, but, but so then the thing about it is like you know the kind of cool full circle thing is once my kid got older you know once my son got older i would talk to him and I'd be like, hey, yo, man, do you really want to do this Christmas thing or whatever? And he's like, nah, dad, it, this, that, nah, this is lame. I don't want to go. I'm like, all right, cool. And then we go play Call of Duty or some shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so it was once we kind of crossed that threshold, we were able to be cool. But um, but yeah, man. So, yeah. So for a long time, I really just beat myself up as a dad. And uh, I think in some ways, um, as a as a father, it kind of maybe led me to overcompensate in some ways, um, just in with whether it being in with gifts or just, you know, not not being all the way a helicopter parent, but just 
wanting to show that I was involved, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um that definitely showed up in um in in my relationship with both of them. But my 19-year-old, you know, again, his mom, me and his mom, uh we were in college, we were super young. And then my 14-year-old, she was from he's from uh my ex-wife and we've since, you know, we've since divorced and and everything, but uh but he, you know, my, he was the one that was with me. He's been with me like from day 1. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my 19 year old, he was with his mom. He was with his mom until he was about 12. I wanted, I wanted him to come stay with me prior to that. I wanted him to come stay with me when he, he was probably around like eight, you know, seven, eight. You know what I mean? I was like, but, you know, me and his mom weren't really seeing eye to eye at that time. And I think she was, you know, right. And, you know, not wanting him to come during that time. But, uh, but he ended up coming to stay with me when he was like 12. And he lived with me until he was probably around like 16 or 17, something like that. You were furious and Styles? I had, it was Furious Styles time, bro. They right, had to right. call me in, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, you know, man, he, he stayed with me. And ultimately, it was it was him. You know, he decided to go back and live with his mom. And we sat down and, and talked about it. And I just said, well, look, man, I mean, look, you know, this is not a prison. You know, we, we tried it. Um, you know, you were able to make an informed decision. You know what it looks like staying with me in the summertime. Cause there's a difference between summertime dad and school year dad. Of you know course. what I'm saying? Of course. You know? So yeah, you know, summertime, it's all the fly shit. We going <laughs> water parks and goddamn, we jumping on trampolines. We doing all kind of wild shit, but you know, it's school time. It's like, all right, bro, you better, you gotta, you better get this goddamn work. You gotta and curse so, you. Yeah. The you whole know, nine. It's mm-hmm. all kind of boundaries. Right. And so, yeah, brother, it was, um, I said, but you know, you, you're able to make an informed decision. You know what it's like with me in summertime and in school time. And you know what it's like with your mom in summertime, school time as well. So if you've seen both scenarios and you decide you want to go live back with your mom, Hey brother, this, this ain't no prison. You know what I'm saying? I ain't, I ain't the warden. You know what I mean? And, um, the main thing that I, that we walk away and, and, and me and my son now, my 19 year old, like we're able to like talk about a lot of this stuff now and I'm able to talk with him in a way at 19 that I wasn't able to talk to him at 12, 13, you, you know what I'm saying? Right. And, um, I just said, man, you know, at the end of the day, I just wanted y'all to know me. You know, I, I if, if I can say that I did a better job at, you know, being open and being honest and and being accepting, if, if I can do a better job with you than my dad did with me, then, you know, I've I've done my part to kind of break that chain. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and um, to, to stop that cycle. Are they with you now during the whole shelter in place? Well, my 14 year old is my 14 year old. He's with me like he I have like custody of him. So he's with me like all the time. Uh, My 19 year old, he's with his mom and they're they're He's he's with her and they're just both sheltering in place. And we you know we talk, we catch up and just make sure everything's cool. But uh, but he's with her. How has it been with your 14 year old with all this? Because I know me and my kids, we're, we're it's with day 45 or something. And mm-hmm. I got 17 year old and an 11 year old girl. 17 year old boy and they've been doing the whole homeschool thing and it's been chill for the most part but i think we we hit our breaking point recently because we've been trying to do keeping them on their chores and the Mm -hmm. difference is when you have to do dish duty during school time and everybody can leave you're only doing the dishes once a day maybe but we all home and there's dishes several times a dish and it's been like do you see these dishes in this sink? And they don't even have to wash them in my house. They just have to put them in the damn dishwasher. Yeah, just stack them. Just stack them. <laughs> right. So what have you been, how, what, 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 have you had any challenges adjusting to this confinement? Man, um, for us, it, it's not really been, I mean, I, I can't say it hasn't been an adjustment. I mean, it's certainly been an adjustment, but um, I can't say it's been bad. It's been, it's been pretty good. You know, um, and when I say that, you know, we, you know, we have a house that's uh, a house is, you know, big enough for everyone kind of has their own space. So if we need to just kind of go to our corners, then we can just do that. Um, and in terms of uh, just kind of keeping our rituals and keeping, um, you know, the chores and all that, we we're all really big on that. I think I think a lot of people are, are kind of uh, attaching to their rituals and to their just their daily routines and customs because that kind of uh it retains some degree of normalcy in the midst of all this shit you know what i mean so 
with us, it's, it's still the same thing. I still, you know, clean up day, still Saturday. That's International Black People Clean Up Day. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So right. clean up day, still Saturday. You know, you still, you know, vacuum, you know, mop floors, sweep, whole, do the bathrooms, the whole nine. Um, yeah, I mean, we're still pretty much keeping our general routine. Um, the conversation I had with my with my 14 year old is that because he's doing like you said, they're, they're all doing the, um, the, the, the schooling now just to kind of homeschool and it was um i think it was kind of frustrating for him you know because he's like man i'm you know like he's like you know but i said well man the thing is is that you got to use this time kind of as training ground you can use this to work to your advantage and teach you how to work independently i said because if anything this is kind of preparing you more for college even more so than a regular classroom would be because You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, you know, you get to college, it ain't six straight hours of just drill, drill, drill instruction. It's nah, you get the assignments, teach you go over for a little bit, you take them and, you know, you do them, you know, you can work at your own pace as long as you get it done in time. I said, so now, like now, like he gets up and he does like uh, his, his lessons and then I think they have a break and then he finishes. I mean, he's normally done by like one o'clock every day. Mm. I said, man, that's look, bro, shit, <laughs> nigga, you don't, you don't understand it right now, nigga. You living, <laughs> right, <laughs> shit, right. what? Yep. I said, so man, use this to your advantage because if you can do this now, if you can adapt to this kind of new reality, and you can still find a way to be on point to retain, you know, what's being taught, ask for help when you need it and get your work in on time and work independently and, and still be sufficient, man, those skills are going to carry you a long way, a long way outside of the classroom. Facts, facts. Yeah, I want to bake your noodle real quick. Do you remember the night of the menstrual show show backstage to BB Kings? Okay. You, your, your then girlfriend wife was okay. pregnant. Yeah. And, I, and I, that, that's, that memory sticks out in my mind because you were in your Percy Miracles outfit and someone had come into the backstage dressing room and it's, it with a cigarette and the whole squad kind of just was like, no, <laughs> put that on. Yeah. Hell yeah. Get that shit out of here, bro. <laughs> what do you remember? What do you remember about that night? Because I'm thinking that was the first time I guess you're performing as little brother in a very long, in a, in a bit and you're mm-hmm. about to be a father for the second time. Like, was that, was that in your mind as you're performing? Like, yo, I got a kid coming. Like I got to make. Oh. Hell yeah. I mean, it certainly <laughs> was a, yeah, it definitely was in my mind, man. Um, you know, at the time, you know, and I, I will say as well, um, you know, the circumstances under which I had my second son, I mean, I was married at the time when I had my second son. So, it was it was very different. And, um, you know, that was another thing that just to kind of before, you know, to touch back on just something you mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, the relationship with my dad. That was a moment where I, I kind of had more sympathy for him uh, because my dad had me. He, he had a, a lot of kids. Right. So it was a lot. I still I still have siblings that I haven't met. You know, oh, what wow. I mean? like, you know what I'm saying? So it's 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 a lot of us. But he um you know he had me and my brother so my my brother Kendrick you know we we call ourselves hood twins like my birthday is i'm in i'm in uh i'm in december and he's in july Okay. So yeah, I mean, wow. well, yeah. okay, I got you. Yeah. I got you. you feel me? <laughs> yep. 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 And, yep. and I and our moms, our mothers were classmates. So oh, Papa yeah. was a player. Ooh. Man, listen, Ooh. let me tell you, that nigga was a Rolling Stone, a Beetle, <laughs> goddamn the Who, nigga. He was he was all them niggas. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah, brother. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Did, um, you have, did you ever have that moment where you looked in the mirror and realized you were your father's son? I remember absolutely. Was, Hell oh, yeah. wasn't that crazy? Like I remember the two things that, that stand out for me is looking in the mirror and seeing my father, and then the first time I opened my mouth and his voice came out of my face. Mm, that yeah. that shook me like oh shit because I was talking to my kids and I told them y'all got life too good. I said oh shit I'm my father. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for better or for worse, that's what I've become. Nah, bro, 
It is so real. Yeah, man. Like I had, I had that realization. I mean, uh, several times, but you know, I was, I remember, you know, cause my son, uh, my, my oh, sorry, not my son. My dad was 17 when he had me. So my, me and my brother Kendrick, six months apart. And mm-hmm. you know, this is, you know, they were kids, you know, when they had, when, when we were born, but then later on in life, he got married and he had my brother and sister, uh, my brother and sister Lauren and Lawrence, he had them, and you know they were it was in the context of a marriage. Like he was married to their mom and, and all of that. And you know when he passed, there was a lot of things that my sister, you know, was kind of you know angry with him about, and rightfully so. You know what I mean? But um, having a conversation with her, and I just told, her, I said, well, you know, listen, you got to understand at the time when he had me and Kendrick versus the time he had y'all, those were two completely different times in his life, Mm. you know, and he was a different person in that era. You know what I mean? So, you know, the time, and, and, and as I was talking to her about it, it really made me think about my kids. It's like, man, like the time, the person who I was at the time when I had my 19 year old and the time I was when I had my, my 14 year old, like, man, those were two even though they you know five years apart like five years in your early 20s like man that's fucking sea change dude you know what i'm saying it is is. (laughs) they they got lawrence with the best buy job and uh, right versus lawrence with the tech job that is exactly (laughs) what it is that is it they feel like they got the parent that you know is well and yo and and it's like that it's like yo if you're a firstborn child i mean you know yeah it's kind of you're the guinea pig you know because i was a firstborn kid you know and you know like when you were the firstborn like you yeah it's a lot of shit that your parents don't get right but by the time your younger or your, your younger siblings come around that could be at a point in a time where uh, a point in their marriage or in their just their adulthood where they're more stable you know what I'm saying? They they paper might be better. They could be in a better part, a better place in their marriage. So the household is not as, uh, uh, you know, uh, toxic or whatever. And, you know, man, those are things you have to take into into consideration. So seeing that definitely um helped me relate to my sons a little better because I had to keep in mind that they've been growing with me through all of this. And the person I am today is not the person that I've always been, you know, and to give them some um, to give them some leeway and be compassionate and, you know, towards them about that, because I, it was a lot of growing pains that, that I went through and, and still going through, you know. Yeah, I, you said on um, when everything is new. Now I go out on the road, come home, home see my kids like, Dan, when did you get a mustache? How did your. How did you balance being an artist and a parent? I didn't. Mm. There was no balance. Like there was no, I mean, I can't, I can't speak for anyone else, um, but I, I know for me, there was no balance. It was just, you know, going back to your question about the night of the minstrel show, uh, show, uh, 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 release and the, the show at BB Kings and all of that when my then wife was pregnant. Yeah. I mean, the, the only thought in my mind was survive. Just survive, you know, and and provide. That was that was the main thing. Provide, you know what I mean. I just gotta provide, you know what I mean. So I gotta go out here. I gotta do these shows. I gotta do these records, these mixtapes, you know. And that was it. Like I wasn't thinking about being, you know, a a parent or, you know, my only thought was okay if I'm in the house with my kids and they not broke the way I was broke, then I did my job. Like that was it. I don't think the emotional component of it came into context until a lot later, because I mean, again, like you, you just got to think it's like, you know, when, when the kids are young, um, at least, you know, from, and, and on my side, you know, when I had boys, so when boys are young, you know, this is all about mommy. It's mama's the, the superstar, right? It's just mommy, mommy, mommy. I want my mommy. I want my mommy. You know what I mean? But, then once they kind of cross that threshold about uh, 10, 11, 12, you know, depending, that's when they want to be around masculine energy. They want to know what dad is doing. They want to, you know, they, they want to do some, they want to do some man shit. You know what I mean? So um, I thank God that, um, you know, while I wish as they were younger, I wish I could have been a more emotionally involved parent. Um, you know, I thank God that, 
me working so hard and grinding so hard in my 20s set me up so that I could be the dad that they needed in my 30s and in their teens. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> um, because by that point in time, by the time they kind of hit that, the Furious Styles age, you know, I was more established. You know, I didn't have to be out on the road for six, seven, eight weeks at a time. You know what I mean? Like I actually had established myself and it set up a, a, a economic system to where, you know, I could actually be around, you know, I didn't have to just always be on the chase, you know what I mean? And um, so, yeah, it, it kind of, uh, in the end, I would say it all worked out because I was able to be there for really pivotal and crucial times in their lives when they really needed me. Mm. I'm going through this, this, the lyrics, son and these niggas that makes me a parent four years ago. My girl made me a parent four years later, Kev's beats. We be sharing going back and forth in the car straight feeling. And they say I'm raising hell. I just call him call Dylan. Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> what made you, what made you want to, cause a lot of MC, they don't put none of their personal life in their rhymes but that's definitely yeah. not been you what made you want to rap about because you the song was called beats and rhymes and right you just put in the reference <laughs> to your, raising your kid i get the the sun metaphor you stretch it out but yeah what, what do you remember about that and what made you you know want to be so open on with record? that song man with that song um particularly i mean that was what me and my son used to do like my son when he was a kid this is my oldest son dylan he would listen to care brown's beats like i would make him like beat cds and just cds and stuff to listen to because he had his own little radio in his room to go to sleep and um you know even when he was a kid like when he was you know before he was born i would make i made like little tapes and um cds for him and uh for his mom to play you know what I'm saying? I'd be like, yo, he need to he need to know what the real shit is. Like, play this and you know, put your stomach to the speaker and shit. You know what I mean? Like it, it was real. I was like, yo, I, I can't have a I can't have no kid with whack tasting music, dude. You fucking up the vibe. But I tried that, it didn't work for me, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> My son yeah. is his own person, but you know, I tried. Bro, they're their own people, and they <laughs> they are and they're you are absolutely 100 percent like they're their own people and they're gonna be who they are, you know. It's some it's some parts you can look and say, okay, I see that comes from your mama. You see some shit, it's like, okay, I see that comes from me, but then it's gonna be that other part. It's just like, nigga, I don't know where the fuck this came from. <laughs> This is yep. all yours. <laughs> right. Yep. Right. This ain't, right. you know what I mean? So, but yeah, bro. But so that was what we would do. So with that record with the Kev Brown joint, um, he would Kev Brown beats would like that would be his nighttime music. He'd put it on and go to sleep and listen to Kev music. And the funny part was that at that time, Kev lived right around the way from uh my from my my his mom in Maryland like they were they were kind of in the same neighborhood and so uh, and it was Grap Lover uh, big ups to my man Grap Lover uh he had linked us up you know what i'm saying and so cuz cuz um uh Grap was in Maryland too at the time he was living there i think Grap is still in Maryland but uh he was up there and so you know what i mean and so he he linked us up and so it was just all family you know what i mean and so in putting it in the song you know the thing i always tell people cuz they've asked me that question before you know as just as a writer as you know rapper produce whatever you know your family is going to be a part of my art it's never going to be a part of my act Mm. And there's a difference, you know what I'm saying? Just as a person, just as the things you experience, the things that you, you know, that you go through just day to day, um, just the conversations you have with your family, with, with your people around you or whatever, that's inevitably, inevitably going to find its way into the art that you create. That I think that's organic. That's a very... I think that's a very natural kind of uh, way of creating what is not natural is okay, son, when we drop loving it, I want you to come out and rap my verse. You know what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> like, okay. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not something that, you know, I, I, that I wouldn't necessarily do. Although, I mean, I can remember like one time, like my son, cause my, this is again, my oldest son, Dylan, I would have to bring him with me on the road a couple of times. You know what I'm saying? A couple of times I just, I, he had to come with me and he would be backstage and he would want to get to the mic. Like he wanted to rap. And he's mm. like four years old. He's like, I, 
that. I want to rap that. I'm like, what? Yeah. And so <laughs> I would give him the mic. And he would spit the whole verse, like he would rap yeah. the whole verse, and I let him do. I let him. I might let him do that like once or twice, and you know it was funny. But I was like, okay, nah, man, I'm not. I'm not making my family a part of my act. You know, everything can't be for sale. You know what I'm saying? Right. And um, does, and that was something have, that I does, always stressed him. Does he have artistic aspirations? Do either of them? Do they? Do they uh, yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, my my oldest son does. He he has artistic aspirations. He wants to rap and sing and produce and you know, he he wants to do it and, and I'm just like, "Well, look, man, I mean, if you want to do it, I can help you, you know what I'm saying, once you show me what it is." But I'm like, "Bro, you got to create. You you got to make something." You know what I'm saying? Um and and I think sometimes particularly with him, but I see it in a lot of kids uh of this generation, they're they get kind of scared because they want it to be right. And and I think maybe maybe it's him because he's my son and he like looks at me like whatever. But I'm just like, look, man, I don't care. Even if it's bad, I told him, look, your first songs, they're always gonna be bad. They're gonna suck. It's okay. Like all our first <laughs> right, songs right. suck. You know what I mean? Right. It's just it's what it is. That's part of the process. But just get it out. It's not about being good in the beginning because you're not good. Nobody's good when they first start out. It's not about being good. It's just about being productive and just getting words down on the page or if it's just voice notes or if it's just whatever, you know what I mean? And and the kids now, they got, you know, tools available to them and technology. Like, niggas can make an album on their damn iPhone, you know what I right. mean? Right. So, um, so, yeah, so he has music aspirations. My, my 14-year-old, Andrew, he... I don't, he don't really care. Like he just, he's more of a kind of a science kind of techie kind of kid. So he don't, I mean, he listens to music. Like he, um, he was the one that he was telling me about the, the Travis Scott Fortnite joint nice, <laughs> uh, the nice, other day. He, nice. he, he showed me that. I was like, oh damn, this shit, this shit hard. This shit was dope. And so, um, but he so he listened to his like trap music and he listened to all like all the young the ignorant nigga like he, he's all into all of that so he keeps me abreast on what the face tat rap is going on <laughs> <laughs> oh man my, my son spends the hours on soundcloud listening to video game scores like mm. to, uh, to Undertale and shit like that. Like I'm like, yo, you just opened me up to some stuff I had never even knew existed. But yeah, that's his wow. shit. He's not even into like commercial artists like that. My my daughter, on the other hand, she listens. She's all day on Pandora. You know, <laughs> she's the one doing the dishes with the Pandora on the iPad, and she listens to everything from a Tribe Called Quest to Ed Sheeran. She is. She wants. To yo, get- bro. But you know what, man? That's so. I think that's great. And you know, I've had this conversation before. Like, it's so great. Our kids are going to be so much more music advanced than we were specifically yeah. because they have access to everything and they don't got to pay for it <laughs> yep you know what i'm yep. saying it was plenty of times i mean think about how many times you was in a record store as a kid and or as you know, a teenager or whatever and it was like yeah i really like this tears for fears song but <laughs> these niggas ain't about to get my last 20 dollars though <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> so yeah. let me go on and you know, let That's me go on and buy this. Yep. Yeah, let me get this damn this KRS one. I know what this is. Right. So we didn't really have that room to to explore, you know, back right. then, and they have it now. But yeah, my my sons, they're the same way. Like they'll listen to damn. My son will listen to the Beatles, and then he'll listen to fucking TJ Six X and <laughs> like all these niggas with all like all NBA young, like all the all them niggas that whole crew of just auto-tune rap niggas right. he, he's in it all but then he'll listen to stevie wonder you know what i mean so welcome to fathers who bother a podcast for men who are as dad as we want to be in part two of our interview with fonte coleman we talk about little brother's diary of a mad black daddy skit fonte voicing a children's book and addressing his father's passing in his music check it out so who was the father on Di- the diary of a mad black daddy skit. Who was voicing that? <laughs> man, uh, the diary of mad black daddy skit. That's uh, my man, Jermaine. Shout out to my homie, Jermaine White. Uh, Jermaine is a cat that he was, this is just a dude that used to be at our barbershop. Mm. And um, he would just be at the barbershop in Durham. And uh, my man, Ked, shout out to my man, Kedra Mims 
who was uh, uh he was, who was my barber for many years. And Jermaine was just a dude that would just come in the barbershop and just be talking shit. He just had <laughs> just this great, loud, boisterous voice. Like it was just he was just the barbershop homie. And so um, when we were working on Minstrel Show, I was like, man, um, we need somebody to, you know, we, I need somebody to be the Mad Black Daddy. And I can't remember if it was Doe or if it was Pooh that was like, yo, why don't we just, like, why don't we holler at Jermaine? And I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And so we brought him in and, you know, he killed it. You know, I gave him, like, some lines. I was like, okay, do this, do that. And he riffed a little bit and he killed it. So then, you know, of course, you know, it's now it's 14 years later and me and Pooh are working on Made Lord Watch. And I wanted to bring him back in some kind of way. I was like, yo, I got to bring back the Mad Black Daddy. Right. But where is he? Like, I literally hadn't seen Jermaine since we cut that skit for the <laughs> show. Right. And so I reached out uh, to my man, Kid, uh, my old barber. I was like, yo, bro, what's good? You got a line on Jermaine? He's like, man, I, I think this still his number. But here. So I ended up hitting Jermaine, and it's still him. And I'm nice. like, yo, what up? He's like, what's up, Jay? What up, man? Y'all need me again? What up, man? I'm just... He just, he goes right into character on the phone. It was the funniest shit. So, uh, <laughs> so me and Pooh, I ended up taking uh, just kind of my little mobile setup to his crib in Durham. Right. And uh, I had my, I just had my laptop, and I had just my little kind of podcaster mic that I use. And right. we cut that shit in his closet. We cut that shit in the closet at his crib. Right. And uh it was the exact same energy. I mean, he 14 years later, still the same guy, still the same voice, just <laughs> just so black and so fucking obnoxious. I loved it. And um, but that's him. That's uh my homie Jermaine White. Okay. For those that don't know, where on the new album is he? You said you so brought him back. He's yeah, he's on he's on the Diana uh Change My Life. Okay. Uh yeah. Cornell, I can't believe you got me up here, these bootleg ass council. I'm gonna fuck you up. Like, <laughs> that shit was so fucking great. Like he he just had so many outtakes. It was just shit he would do, and he would like start going, but then he would stop. And I'm like, bro, you thinking about? It? I can't believe Cornell, you got me up in here like I'm a fucking immigrant. It was, it was just all this ignorant shit he was saying. <laughs> it was fucking hilarious. So, but yeah, he, he's uh, that's him, uh, Jermaine White. He's on uh, Diana Changed My Life on May Lord Watch and. Uh, Diary of a Mad Black Daddy on um on what you call it on uh, uh, Minstrel Show. He's yeah. also and now I think about them, I forgot. He's also t- uh, tucked very d- d- deep. He's also on Get Back. We brought him back uh, on Get Back for I think it was the skit before after the party where it's like the club let out skit or like the club parking lot skit. Oh, the and- banana pudding. I'm gonna go up to get a banana pudding shake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was me saying that, but yeah, that right. song after the party. So it's yeah. like the skit I think that leads into that. He would we have him on there, kind of like he's in the parking lot pulling up on Cornell, like okay. telling him to come out the club. But yeah. it's like you have to really listen to hear it. But he's on there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so you voiced a children's book, a, a bedtime yeah. story. That joint is hilarious. Please tell me about <laughs> you, we used to have money and now we have you. <laughs> yo, man, that was something. Yo, shout out, uh, shout out to my man Corey Richardson out of Chicago, man. Uh, Corey's a brother who I had known just for for many years, just through OK Player. Um, you know, he would just. You know, we were just all on OK Play together in, in the lesson and general discussion, just shooting the shit about music or whatever. And, um, you know, he was just a cat that was just kind of always around. And so uh, Twitter, you know, we started following each other on Twitter and everything. And uh, he was tweeting one day about a children's book that he had done. And um, and I knew Corey's humor. Corey has like the very we have very similar kinds of humor, just very kind of dark, you know, deadpan in some ways. And, you know, just. Like he, Corey would be the guy that would like me that would also say, why the fuck am I coming to this Christmas play? Like <laughs> we're cut from that cloth. It's like, why, right. like, like, why do I want to like, fuck these kids? I want to go home. Like he, he, he would say that. So when I saw the damn um, joint, when I saw the, 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 the title in the book, I hit him up. And I was like, yo man, um, you know, I'll, I'll voice this for you. And he was like, yeah, you know, that, like you be doing that. I'm like, yeah. And so then I was like, well, man, you know, I think it might be dope. Like if we had like Zoe, let me holler at Zoe and see if we can do some music to it, whatever. 
And he was like, word? Like you th-? I said, yeah. I said, let's let's just see. I mean, I don't know if this will work. I think it'll work, but let's just try it. And so um, so Zoe, like I had a, a track of his over here. And the idea was that I was like, okay, what if you could narrate a book? Like if you were a book narrator, but you had Michael McDonald doing your ad libs. <laughs> And that was the that was the bit. <laughs> so it's me telling this children's story, but then singing as Michael McDonald, like ad living through the story. So yeah, you can check that out. We used to have money, now we have you. It's on Audible, I think. It's on, I think it's like Amazon. And uh yeah, you can you can just get it, uh, you can get it wherever audiobooks are. Back to you putting your family and specifically your father in your music. You really helped me personally with the whole trilogy. I call it <laughs> Expensive Jeans, Cry No More, you know, those yeah. songs. Because I was literally driving in the limo to my father's funeral listening to that because it was the only thing. That and Common's song to his father, mm-hmm. I, I put them in a playlist. Um, all those songs he put, he bookended his albums with to his father. I was playing, I had those on repeat trying to work through my shit. So mm. what, what do you think you had to work through? Like what was, what was your, what were some of your issues, I guess? Um, just the, the loss, you know, cause I, mm. was, I was very close to my father and I, you mentioned earlier that something you, you wish you had done as far as getting to know your dad. I had actually interviewed my father, um, back when I was running Watch Loud, about his taste in music and how he discovered things. And I always tell people, it was one of the things I, um, with, I, I, I suggest everyone do, if you have mm-hmm. a parent who's alive, is sit down and interview your parents. Have, that is have, so real. Have that, that so memory, real. have that information, have their voice. Like when I miss him, I can still play that and still hear his voice. Because honestly, it's been two years now and sometimes I forget what it sounded like already and mm. I, and then having it to, to, to play back, but just dealing with my anger. Cause I felt like it was unfair the way he went. The fact that he was, you know, he was, he was a walking dude. Like my father mm-hmm. riding a bike, walking the streets, you know, he did not stay home. So I knew how much it killed him almost literally to be in a bed 24 seven, not being able to move. I know he hated mm, and yeah. he could, and he couldn't talk. That was hell. That was hell for him. That was hell for him. And it just made me feel like, and I felt helpless. I felt mm. so helpless because I couldn't do anything to, 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 to fix this situation. And all I wanted to do as a son was to make him feel better. And I couldn't. So, and I just wanted to connect to other men dealing with, their fathers and their in and their relationships with them and you in common were the only ones I had um to to kind of fall back on. But then specifically, you know, Cry No More was just like everything you said was just like, damn, he's like in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you so much, man. Um so just talk to me a little bit about that. Did that help did that give you closure? Um, it, it did in some ways. I mean, you know, I don't think you ever really have closure in the sense of, well, it's over. I'm done now. We're good. You know, um, I, I don't think it's that straight of a line, but it definitely did give me um, it was a release. And it was um, just through the process of writing that song and just kind of drawing a lot of parallels, you know, and, and I'm sure that you, you know, can relate to this as a writer. It's like you have a concept in your head. And, you know, you might make your notes, you might make, you know, just kind of uh, ideas you may scribble down or whatever. But it's not until you actually start the process of actually writing it. And when you start writing it, that's when like a third gear kind of kicks in, because there's certain revelations that only come to you in the process of writing. You know what I'm saying? And so in the process of writing, it was things I was like, damn, man, like wow, like this nigga died of all these heart problems and then we left the fucking funeral and went and ate fried chicken. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> just just shit like that. Yeah, I'm like, damn, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, I was at the repast with those words running through my head, but I still fucked up them food. <laughs> oh, no, nah, we still listen. We still gonna eat. We still gonna 
You know, it wasn't because it wasn't the fact that he ate fried chicken at the rebat. No, it's when you eat it every day. Like that's when right, right. you know it's like, bro, you you're not giving yourself a chance in hell to make it out here. But um, but nah, man, yeah, it was it it was tough. And uh I think in the process of just writing them songs, um, you know, when you talk about you asked me earlier about just realizing that you're your father's son, you know, when I was Again, telling his story, you know, he loved his work and his women built like a Clydesdale, went to the city and church in search of supreme clientele. Like I'm listening to his story and I'm telling it and I'm just like, damn, like, I wonder if that's how my kids see me, because as a kid, all I really remember is just watching my dad work like that was it. It was just work, work, work like that was, you know, he had his own business and, you know, that was that was it. And so that was a moment where I was like, man, I don't want my kids, their memory of the only memory they have of me is dad at his computer. Uh. You know, like I, I, we, I got to form something else. We got to go, you know, shoot some hoop. We need to go, you know, play some video games. Like I don't want that to be their only, the only way that they remember me. And, um, yeah, that, that helped me. It did help me, um, put a lot of, uh, it, it helped me let go of a lot, you know what I'm saying? The anger that I had, you know, towards him, um, it, it kind of, it, it kind of made me a little more, a lot more sympathetic towards him, I'd say, yeah. you know, um, and really getting into his stories. Cause what you're saying, you know, that shit is a hundred percent is 100% man, in terms of getting your parents stories and getting their voices because, and I even tell my sons this, you know, I was a complete other person before you per y'all got here. Like I had a whole of like, so all the things that y'all are doing now that you think that, oh, dad, you wouldn't understand, nigga, I had you. <laughs> yes. So anything that you about to tell me something with a girl or something you think, oh, you wouldn't understand how it is with these girls. Nigga, your mama was one of these girls. What the fuck do you mean? I don't understand. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> you, you think your mama wasn't buzzing rope, nigga? Like, what the fuck? Like, you come on, bro. You can't. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I tra- we traumatize our kids with shit like that. Like it's my wife and I would like, you know, we 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 try to be affectionate when we can and mm-hmm. sometimes we forget that they're around and he'll just give the eye roll like, "Oh my god, get a room." Da, da, da. Like, like how I do don't need to get a room. Nigga, I bought a house. <laughs> right. He's like, "How do you live in?" <laughs> How do you think you got here, fool? And he right running away. Oh, dad! Oh, that's gross. Ah, I'm like, Shut yeah, up. yeah, but but that's it. Like, but you, but bro, but that's that's the thing, right? So like, when you're younger, you just see your parents as just mom and dad. But when you right. get older, you start to see them as people. Right. And that was, you know, a big part. When we, you know, you talk about just writing and you know, just kind of working on my album and stuff. Like that was a big part, I think, for me as I got older. I really got to see my dad and and my and both my parents really as people. And once you see them as people, I think your view of them becomes um, a lot more sympathetic and in, in a lot of ways, a lot more informed because now you just look at them as just, they're not mom and dad. These kind of all seeing, you know, all knowing people, you know, they're just people that made decisions and, you know, some were good, some were bad. But they were trying to figure this shit out just like you're trying to figure it out now. Like they were no, you know, me at, you know, 41, you know, with a kid, with a 14 year old. You know, I was no more informed than my dad was when I was 14. You know what I'm saying? Like we we were all trying to figure this shit out. And actually, in some ways, I'm probably more informed now raising my son than he was raising me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um. Because, and I forgot who it was. It was a comedian or somebody that made a joke about how, uh, I think it was Gerard Carmichael that just made the joke about how, you know, our grandfathers were all horrible people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. this, shit, this shit was hilarious. And it's just like, yo, this whole new thing of, this thing of, you know, dads being active and listening and all. Like, nigga, that's some new shit. That <laughs> Like, that's something that just happened, like, in the last, you know, 20 years, 15 years or so. Like, this whole, 
Our fathers weren't in the delivery room. My father was at a bar when I was born. My mother told me. <laughs> my, my mother was in labor. My father was at a bar around the corner, and they just went and got him when I was born. This whole got to be in the delivery room is definitely some new shit. Yeah, so, like co-ed baby showers. Are you <laughs> fucking shitting me? <laughs> like, what the fuck? I'm not going to no goddamn baby shower. Like, no. I, no. I, I would go to my own baby shower, let alone, like, one of my like, one of my wife's friends and he was like, you know, we're gonna have a it's co ed and you can bring your partner, you can bring I don't wanna go fuck I, I don't care. I don't wanna be there. That is I'm old school in that way. That is woman shit. I don't care. Like I will send money, I will buy, send me your Amazon gift registry. I got you. I lace it up. And the little baby gonna have everything. He'll have the finest of everything. But right. I'm not about to sit in no goddamn baby shower, y'all motherfuckers damn play the gender reveal and we eat damn these Swedish meatballs. And no, I ain't doing that. I'm done. <laughs> I mean, you so, gotta wear the fucking shirt, right? You like the fucking baby shower shirt. You know the shirt. The fucking baby shower shirt and take the picture and you gotta wear the baby shower fucking shoes and stuff, man. No. The hat. It's the hat. They make the hat, the hat. out of yes, the tissue oh, paper out dude. of the plate. <laughs> It is so fucking humiliating. <laughs> I'm not going to subject myself to this. Like, no. <laughs> but this is new. But these are all new development. You know what I mean? Like that, like back in, come on, man. In what? Like in the 70s, 80s, your dad coming to a co-ed baby shower. Are you, that might have got you kicked out your house. <laughs> like, you, know you know what I'm saying? Like you ask your, your dad sitting in his recliner. Hey, dad, I want to talk to you about something. You know, I know you're watching in the heat of the night right now, but uh, it's a baby shower coming up. <laughs> that shit might get you written out of the will. Nigga. Are you shitting me? <laughs> get the fuck out of here. <laughs> uh, so I have a segment I want to do called The Moment I Feared because it's inspired oh, by a, a moment when my son, when he was about, I want to say four, came downstairs nonchalantly and quietly and told his mother and I that he had swallowed a battery. Oh my God. A, a little watch battery from his Game Boy, one of his Nintendo toys or whatever. And that just threw us into a panic, which led to hospital visit, which led to mm -hmm. us having to monitor his poop for the battery. Make sure he got it out. Make sure yeah. he got it out and fishing out of his feces for a battery. <laughs> so do you have a moment as a as a newer parent where you were just like, yo, what the hell am I going to do in this situation? I don't have one as extensive as that one. I've never had the pleasure of digging through feces to... <laughs> you know to dig out you know a fucking game boy battery that that's that sucks uh <laughs> i did have the uh experience of um and i think I, I told you about this i think one of first off as the father of two boys you're gonna have several fucking moment i feel you know moments <laughs> like them shits happen you know a lot uh but i definitely think it was one where i found out that my son my oldest son at the time was renting his shoes out in school what he was renting he was he was renting his his shoes out like this was the wildest this was the wildest shit ever like he was so his report i've, I've told i've told the story like once twice before so he was a he had done good in school he had done good in school and you know we had all bought him shoes because he you know like the kids they like jordans and all this shit so I was like, all right, man, cool. You know, you, you know, you like shoes. So he had done well on his report card. So we all laced him with shoes. Like I bought him a pair. Uh, like his mama bought him a pair. My mama bought him a pair. Like it, I mean, he we just all, you know, we came together and you know, we we laced him. So um, you know, so he had probably about like, yeah, probably like four or five pairs of shoes, which as a kid in middle school, like that's some baller shit. You know what I mean? Because and then I even tell my son now, I'm like, look, bro, I'm not buying you. You're not getting no more than like two pair of shoes. You're getting like a school pair. You're getting a play pair or an, and maybe like a pair that we shoot ball in or go to the gym in or whatever. But it doesn't make any sense for you to have like six, seven pairs of shoes that you're going to fucking outgrow in six months. Like right. that's, you know what I mean? Like you don't become a collector until you stop growing. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so, but yeah, but at the time you know, he had like several pairs. So one day he came home with a pair of shoes that I had never seen before. And I said, hey, man, where you get them? 
He's like, oh, uh, you know, me and my friend, you know, we we just traded. And I say, y'all traded? Like, what the fuck you mean? We we just trade. I let him get a pair of mine, and we just gonna trade for. I said, okay, well, when was when is this trade over with? When you gonna get the ones back? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get them back like in a couple of days. I said, all right, well, I, I let it go. So then he comes back, and like a week or two goes by, and he still had them same shoes. Mm. And um, so we're in the car one night, and we were going to buy something. I was going, I think I was going to buy him like a coat that night. He needed like a winter coat. And um, he was like, well, yeah, dad, you know, I got some money. Somehow it came up that he had money. And I said, where you get the where you get the money from? Where you get five dollars from? Oh, uh, cause I um I found five dollars walking on my way to school. <laughs> I said, look, man, look now, come on, bro. I'm gonna need you. I'm gonna need you to lie a little better than that. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need you to lie like you got a daddy that read books, nigga. Come on, now. come on, come on. Get, 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 give, give me something better. I'm gonna try again. Just, no, uh, uh, no, I, I had money left over from 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 Christmas. I said, I know you didn't have money left over from Christmas because I took you to damn uh, Hollister and you bought that hoodie and all that shit. I, I watched you spend all your damn money from Christmas, so I know you ain't got no Christmas money left over. Like, where you get the money from? So finally, he breaks down and he's like, "Well, Dad, I've been renting my shoes." I said, "You've been doing what?" He said, "I've been renting my shoes. You like kids at school? They like my shoes." And so I just let him rent them for five dollars. I said, okay. I said, okay. Boy, listen, let me tell you something. I was so motherfucking mad. I I turned I turned the car around. I just turned the car around. I just came straight home. I was so goddamn hot. I said, all right, man. I said, okay. So I got home. We got in the house. I gave him a trash bag. I said, I want you to go upstairs and go get all your shoes <laughs> and just put them in put them in this bag. And he's just quiet. And he's like, what the fuck? So he goes and gets them. He puts all his shoes in the bag. I said, man, well, what's your, um, what's your favorite, what, what, what's your favorite pair? You know, which one's your favorite pair? And he was like, uh, probably, you know, these joy, you know, that these, these threes I got, I said, okay, well, we ain't, we ain't gonna keep them. I'll let you get these Adidas. These are the ones we bought just for play with. You can wear these, you wear these Adidas. You know what I mean? And so I took the rest of his shoes. I had them in the bag. I said, I said, this is what's happening. I said, You've been running a business without a business license. I said, <laughs> I said, now in the real world, in order for you to run any kind of business, you have to have proper, uh, you know, you got to check in with the proper authorities and get the proper licensing in order to legally run this business. Because you live with me, I am the authority. You did not check with me for running this business. So now what we're going to do, we're going to do what is known as seizing your assets. <laughs> Because you've been running this business without a license, one. And two, you haven't been reporting the income that you've made from this business. <laughs> so now what we got to do is we got to seize all your assets as well as take whatever money. How much, how much money you got on you right now? What you got? And he had his wife. I got like $25. I said, yeah, yeah, give me that. That's mine. That's just give me. That's that's my $20, $25. I said, so you can just give me that. I said, because now we got to go through and see exactly how much you've made during this business and you know what you see so, so we can determine what the applicable taxes are mm -hmm. that's what business is. that's what it is and he was just sitting there he was like what in the hell so i took his jones i put the motherfuckers in the damn uh i put them in the trunk i put his shoes in, in the trunk and he had just one pair of shoes for like months so he finally comes back to me this is like months later it's a couple months later and he's like, Dad, I, I want to talk to you about something. And I'm like, all right. And, you know, we were talking and it, we were talking about something totally unrelated. But then out of nowhere, because you took my shoes and you don't even understand why the, you just took them. Like he just kind of got mad. He was really mad about the shoes. I said, OK, man. I said, yeah, I did take your shoes. I said, that, that happened. He said, well, I just don't understand. I said, OK. I said, I said, listen, let me ask you a question. I said, what do you do? Because you were renting your shoes for five dollars. I said, what do you do? If somebody goes and takes your shoes, stomps in a mud puddle, and then brings them back to you, what do you do? Well, I'll probably clean them off. I said, so let me get this straight. So someone's going to take your property, deface it, make it so now you can no longer make money off this product, and you're going to clean it up. How do you think that's going to make you look? How's it going to make you look? to the, What does that say to other people about what they can do to your property? So he got quiet. He was just he was just sitting there looking. I said, OK, I said, you know, let's go for another another thing, because by this time he had told me 
he had the shoes that he had traded with his homie. He had bought them. His homie sold them to him for fifteen dollars. Wait, and these what? was like the joy, bro, I, nigga. This shit, this yo, know, it gets so it gets so crazy. This nigga had sold because like he had had it was a pair of the um it was the threes. I can't remember which one the throw, but it was the it was like the classic like the black red the black white and red uh threes. I can't remember the fucking. No, no, they, I'm sorry, they weren't threes, they were the fours. They were the fours. I can't remember which one, but anyway, it was just the classic colorway. The Spizikes. It wasn't the Spizikes. It wasn't the Spizikes. It was I, I can't remember. I'm I'm not a sneakerhead like that. So I gotcha. please all the sneakerheads will listen. Please uh, forgive me. But um <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it was them fucking Jordans. I but bottom line, I know them shits cost most some goddamn fifteen dollars. I know that. But he had sold his homie sold him his shoes for fifteen dollars. He was wearing them. And so I said, well, man, listen, I said, OK, so I said, so so let's say, for instance, that you're at, a, you know, at your bus stop or whatever, and somebody comes to you and they say, hey, man, they're my brother's shoes. I bought my brother them shoes, man. Take them shoes. I'm going to beat your ass. I said, what would you do? He said, well, dad, I, I, I'd, um, I, I run. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, OK, once again, I'm going to give you a chance to clean that up. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, we, 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 the jury would disregard that statement. <laughs> I'm gonna give you another chance to get this thing right to to to, to revamp your image around oh here. Oh my god! He said, "Okay." He said, "Well, um, I probably, you know, I, I, I probably, I, 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 I fight him." I said, "Okay, so now you're gonna fight over these shoes, and you're gonna get suspended from school." Well, nah, I, I'm not fighting at school. I said, if you're at the bus stop, that is school property. Anything at the bus stop, if you're on the bus, like that is all school property. So anything that happens at a bus stop or on a bus, that is considered something happening at school. And it's going to reflect on you there. So fighting. Okay, so w- what would you do? Uh, I'd probably just go tell a teacher. Okay, so now we're going to snitch. Now that's what we're doing. We, we snitching now. We just... <laughs> Cause, cause that's what I taught you, right? <laughs> you know, I, you know, that's, I, you know that, that's that's just that's the Coleman way. We just go tell it. I just, <laughs> so he got he's still quiet. He just listened. He said, "Okay, well." So then he thinks, you know, he has he's figured it out. Okay, well, I I'll probably just come tell you about it. I said, "Oh, so now I'm your goon. That's what this is. I'm I, I'm your I'm your enforcer in this in this goddamn sneaker racket. That's 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 me. That I'm the muscle. You know, you'll call me to straighten it out." And he was just quite, and I could just see the frustration building on his face when he just realized every answer was the wrong answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I said to him, I said, what I told, I said, listen, man, look, I understand that you want to make your own money. And I understand, you know, Keen kind of even, you know, to what we were talking about earlier about realizing, you know, you're your father's son. Mm-hmm. Nigga, as my grandma said, nigga, you got it honest, right? You didn't steal it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been, you know, working shit since I was fucking 14. You know, I've always wanted to have my own money and be in control of my own desk. Like, so I, you you got it honestly. I get it. It's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with you want to make a way for yourself. And that's commendable. But here's the thing about it. I said, man, you're trying to run a business in school. And school is not the place where you run a business because eventually you're going to run into a conflict in your business that's going to interfere with you being in school. I said, so what's the, I said, you, you letting people, you renting these shoes for $5 and rent your shoe. I said, nigga, what's to stop somebody from renting your shoes for $5 and then selling them to another nigga for 15. <laughs> like, what, you know what I'm saying? Cause you bought this $15 shoes from your homeboy. I said, man, you know, these shoes retail for what? $140, what? 150, whatever. Nigga, who's taking a hundred twenty five dollar loss on some shoes because they're your friend? No, nigga. If somebody is letting something go for that cheap, that means it was never theirs to give. Mm. So you don't know what the fuck you getting into with that. You don't know the story behind these fucking shoes. You, you know what I'm saying? I said, so, dude, so you in this you're setting yourself up trying to run this business. You're going to get into a conflict of somebody either fucking up your shoes or trying to sell your shoes or somebody not wanting to pay you or whatever, you're going to have to handle that conflict via a fight or something. So now you're sitting in the fucking office, in the principal's office and they're like, well, what is the basis of this? What's going on? And everyone, all your homies and friends, well, Dylan is the one behind this this 
re- get, catching Rico charges for the shoe racket. <laughs> and now your ass is sitting at home for the rest of the year. Over five fucking dollars. <laughs> and, oh, he just, and he just sat there. He was just like, okay, dad, I understand. I said, okay, was on you understand? All right, cool. Oh, that was it. Uh, you you, you <laughs> and heavy. I got heavy vibes of I just want to be regular people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 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 right. <laughs> yo, that was the mo- and man, and yo, and the thing I learned about that shit, bro, like it's just you know, it's about the thing just kind of in parenting that just is kind of my that was a golden rule and still is a golden rule for me. If you don't tell it to them, if you don't tell, if you haven't told it to your kids, you have to assume that they don't know. Yeah. You can't assume anything. You, if you, if you haven't explicitly said or laid down a rule or, you know, if you haven't explicitly said it, you got to assume they don't know it. And he just didn't at that time, didn't see. And I was even telling, you know, my, you know, his mom, I was like, yo, I, it wasn't that I didn't want to come down hard on him. You know, I, I wasn't trying to embarrass him or nothing, but yo, I've nigga, I was a kid once I was 14 once. And I know right now you renting sneakers, but nigga, by the time you get to your freshman year, you're going to be selling something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it doesn't, it doesn't stop. I like, you know, I I've seen that, that hustle mentality. It can go, it can go in a positive way or it can go in a very negative way. And, you know, I was just trying to, you know, let him know, like, bro, it, it ain't sweet out here. Like, just, you know, if you want a job, we can, nigga, you can just get a job. But, you know, you ain't this shit you're trying to do, homie. This this has uh, deeper ramifications than you realize. And so that was uh, one of my big moments. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like. <laughs> like what what am i supposed to do with these people i think you handled it admirably so let's, <laughs> thank let's, you brother let's, let's close on what is your favorite part about being a father man i think my favorite part about being a father is um in a, in some ways you know i think being a parent is is almost like time travel you know what i'm saying uh, in in the sense that you get to correct mistakes of your past through your kids. Mm. And, you know, and it's not that, and and it's not to say that you live for your kids and that you make, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't, you can't attach your dreams to your children. I think that's harmful. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if you, you the nigga that always wanted to be pro. So now you couldn't play pro ball. So now you got your son out here running suicides and all this crazy (laughs) shit. (laughs) You would have got that bullhorn and shit. And, you know, and it's like, listen, if that's your son's dream, let it be his dream. But don't put your dream on him, you know. Right. But um, but one of the things that I that, that I do enjoy is just um, being able to when well, my sons come to me with problems and being able to talk to them about it and, and kind of give them instruction of saying, nah, this ain't how you want to handle that. This is the way you know, this is a better way of, of, of approaching this, because that was something that I wish I would have had at that age. You know what I'm saying? I wish, you know, when I was 13, 14 that I would have had my dad to talk to, you know, and, and, and to give me, you know, just some real game on how to move out here, you know? And so when we had these conversations, um, you know, they walk away and, you know, and I just think, man, like these boys are going to be so much better in life than I was, you know, like they're going to, they're going to go on to do things that I, you know, couldn't have dreamed of doing because they're going to have better instruction. You know what I mean? They had, they had a blueprint. I, we didn't have a blueprint. Like I was the only, like I was, me and my homies, as I'm sure a lot of people are doing now, just in quarantine, you know, we're all, you know, having zoom conversations and checking in and stuff. And, you know, a, a very good friend of mine, his mother died a couple of weeks ago. And um, well, they, our best friend's father died from, from this COVID shit. If you yeah, know, man. If you don't know anybody whose parent or grandparent or aunt or something has passed, then you haven't been outside because it's it's real. No, it's it's totally real. This ain't no this ain't no joke. And those two, um, his mom, his mom's death wasn't COVID related. I do have like other people in my family and like in our circle that I've lost, you know, to COVID that you know died specifically from COVID. 
but uh but my buddy his his mom it wasn't COVID related but she passed you know nonetheless and um you know we was all on zoom and we was just you know just talking and just kind of shooting the shit and you know one of my boys he said he was like yo um my homie milk you know who was our uh our, our tour manager uh on with lb and he was just I, I was like you know man out of all of us you know he milk was the only one that had a dad like none of my homies growing up had fathers in their lives. And the thing about dysfunction is just that when you're surrounded by it, you don't even realize that it's a dysfunctional setup mm. because, because none of us had dads, you know what I mean? So it wasn't even like you could compare and contrast, you know what I mean? It was just, okay, my homie milk, like he got his parents, but you know, they, they, you know, that's just one thing you, you don't even look at it as like, damn, like this is something wrong, but none of us, like all my day one homies, like none of us had our, our dads in their lives. And even in my neighborhood, like the homies I would kick it with just, you know, to live, you know, on my block and everything. Like we, there were no fathers around, mm. like none, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, I, I just look at it now. Um, and I think I, I talked to you, we talked this about, you know, uh, uh, a couple of years back, how when my son started having, they homies come over, you know, it really changed my perspective on what fatherhood meant. Yes. And you know what I'm saying? And how, yeah, I remember my granddad and I told you, you know, my granddad, he was Mr. Coleman in this neighborhood. Like he was the house where, you know, everybody would come by and, you know, would have a drink or if you needed a plate of food or, you know, like you needed some advice, whatever, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like right. my, my, my grandfather's house, my grandma's house was kind of the neighborhood spot for that. And, you know, my granddad helped a lot of people. And now it's like, I'm the Mr. Coleman of my neighborhood <laughs> for all my, for all my homies, friends, like for all my, my son's friends, they little homies come through and they want to play PlayStation and damn Xbox. And just, I let them sleep over. I let them, you know, do all that shit. Cause I'm like, man, I know y'all safe here. And so, um, that's probably the, 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 my favorite part of, uh, of, um, of being a dad, of just knowing that I can take whatever, all the mistakes I've made and the, the hardships I went through and just traumas I've experienced. And I can present that to my kids in a way that makes them better. And so they can build off the foundation that I laid and go on to greater and better things and be more dynamic as a result of that. You know, when you talk about Mr. Coleman, I feel like you had a Mr. Coleman moment on who loves you more. I think because that verse, it didn't seem like you were talking to one of your kids, but you were talking to someone who you were, who was a younger person or mentor in mm. your life. Is that correct? Am I, am I reading that? Who right? loves you more? Uh, which I'm trying to think. Which verse? Charity, what charity was? starts at home. Yeah, I know the song. I'm trying to think. Uh, my brother hit me up, said he had to make Bell again because uh. I'm trying to think which verse I know particularly with who loves you more. That was, I mean, one verse is about my brother. Uh, that was definitely kind of talking to my, my younger brother. Okay. Um, Maybe that's what it, I was feeling. It was yeah. definitely an advice. Cause the first one was definitely about, you know, divorce and, you mm -hmm. know, relationship. And the second one was my cousin hit me up, said he had to post bail again. Cause my brother bail again. Got jail again. Yeah. 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 Cause he tried to sell again. And then how am I failing him? And then you just went into the, you know, these youngins went all the spoils with none of the toils. And I was like, damn, damn, <laughs> damn it's bag right now. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Yeah, yeah no, nah, that was it. Yeah, that was definitely kind of frustration. I mean, it was it was particularly about, you know, uh, about my brother. But, yeah, it, it could definitely be applicable to um to to the kids, you know, but particularly like when my son, like right now, like we had a conversation a couple, it was maybe a couple of weeks ago with my, my oldest son and, you know, we was talking about music and I was just kind of telling him about, you know, just the creation and just, we, you know, we're just talking about stuff. And so finally I asked him, I said, well, look, man, well, what have you done? Like, can you play me something? Can you show me something? Can you spit something for me? Like, you know, what's what? And he said, well, dad, you know, I, I, right now I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just work on my image. <laughs> I said, wait. You're trying to work on your image. He's like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking. I'm trying to work on my image. And the thing about it, man, and I had a conversation with another homie of mine, you know, that works with like a lot of youth. And he was like, man, what it is, he said, that's the way they process the world now. Mm. He said, you know, the way they process the world, you know, is not it's not about how much money you have. I mean, if you have the money, you have money, but they're more impressed with your Instagram followers. Mm. 
they're more impressed with oh shit you verified on instagram right like right. that that means something to them you know what i mean so they're very much not to say that they're a shallow generation but they're very much uh they the way they process information and the way they relate to the world it all is based on imaging you know, and and visuals first you know what i mean and so i said well man so i didn't want to just go with my first instinct be like nigga what the fuck is you talking about I just write some goddamn song you know what i mean i didn't want to just amp on him <laughs> Look, this image what the fuck fuck your image nigga write, write some jams right <laughs> but what i said to him i said well listen i understand the images is important to you but maybe a better way to approach it is to start creating songs and then let the songs dictate what your image is mm. Because it's easy to just, I mean, if you if you create an image and then try to write songs based on that image, you're essentially creating a character. Mm. But if you write art or you create art or you make music and then let that music dictate your image, that's when you're really walking and creating in your truth. You ain't got to fake shit at that point. I can be Fonte today, tomorrow, next week, whatever, like. It, 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 it's not a character I have to get into, you know what I'm saying? And he was like, "All right, he's like, I, I get that." He's like, "All right," and you know, he later he let me hear something. I think a little bit later on, and he actually got bars. Like he can rap. I was like, "Yo, man, you sound good." Like, yeah, I was like, "Yo, you can you can rhyme." So, you know, we'll we'll see what he does with it, but you know, he he got to put in the work. <laughs> we'll definitely keep us posted. We'll definitely have to have you come back to give us an update on his 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 budding mc career fonte this has been everything i dreamed it would be <laughs> for real for real um I, I appreciate you um when i can you know i can, had this idea i've had it for years and you know some things have kicked me in the butt of late and hell yeah it's kicking <laughs> everybody listen man listen but it's wrong to get niggas right cuz <laughs> <laughs> shit <laughs> but i said you know what now's the time i've actually learned some things from being on other people's podcasts and talk to friends and i say you know what? okay now i have a plan of action and you know what boom let's do it and this has been an incredible conversation uh, man absolutely likewise brother thank you um for having me as always and thank you for always supporting me and um and brother and i just want to say man like just even what you're doing this podcast i i think it's so great and is a lesson to so many creative people that you don't have to rush into something, right? Like just because you see all your homies going on IG live, that don't mean you got to go on IG live. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like take this time to sit back and find out what your gifts are and then determine the best way to present those gifts in a way that is most useful to the people, you know? And, um, you know, I just, I just commend you just for kind of, you know, because I, you know, I've read about the like the layoffs and and everything, and you know, I, I shot you out, but you know, I I just think it's so dope that you, through all the years that I've known you, regardless of what magazine you were at or whatever, you always had your own shit. You always had your own platform. If it was Watch Loud, if you know, you know, the every what everything like you always was like, yeah, I'm working for this person, but I'm still gonna keep a little piece of myself to do me. And, um, you know, man, and I always just admired that about you uh, creatively and professionally, uh, brother. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to call you a friend and a brother of mine. And just thank you again. And I think this this podcast is going to be a great outlet uh, just for, for men to, to have that conversation about fathers and our fears as fathers, our, you know, everything. I think this is fantastic.